Welcome back to a new year of the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from neuroscientists across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of our members here. Each seminar focuses on one of the new interdisciplinary themes of Cambridge Neuroscience, which we will be launching later this year. For more info on the talks covered in this seminar series and all things neuro related here in Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the University of Cambridge, Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mariana Bozik today. Mariana is an associate professor here at the Department of Psychology at the University, and she's also a fellow and director of studies for psychological and behavioral sciences at King's College um, here in Cambridge. So I'm sure, as all of you know, her research aims to understand the cognitive and neural mechanisms that underpin language comprehension, but also how these mechanisms have evolved and to understand how our brains adapt to the requirements of learning and also for learning a second language. So today we're really happy that she's going to talk to us about how bilingualism modulates the neural mechanisms of selective attention. So welcome, Mariana, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks for the invitation. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about this research to everyone. So what I will do today is present some recent data from the lab um, that basically looked at um, neurocognitive uh, adaptations to the demands of bilingualism. Um, and the focus is going to be on selective attention in particular. And before I start, just wanted to say that this is work of my graduate students, Andrea Alvin and Jackie Phelps is here. So um, basically thanks to them for, for all of this. Um, so to set it all up, I find this a uh, useful analogy really um, in terms of what we would be looking into. So with two languages, uh, what we obviously see at the surface are these two sets of features, these two sets of labels. Uh, so they would have sort of two different sets of things that, that stand for the same concept. However, uh, focusing on just the surface level is going to not reveal necessarily what's going on, because what we are ultimately talking about is uh, the same underlying process or the same underlying system that is supporting the processing of these multiple sets of labels. Um, so, you know, if we have chair, you know, so one label or another in a different language, they're ultimately going to, to sort of map onto the same underlying concept um, that is not going to be language specific in any way. But having to choose between these, having to select one, inhibit the other, is likely to have some effect on this common proficiency you know, system that will have to, in, one, in some way, adapt to, to these various demands. So I think what's interesting here is to look at this sort of adaptation that allows us to um, perform optimally to, to whether you know, this one or the other language context that's being used. So it's effectively stuff under the bonnet that's really interesting here that tells us about these adaptations. So just focusing on the surface level, I think is sort of, yeah, it's not informative enough, possibly misleading. Um, so in, in, in terms of the sort of the broad picture where, you know, where this sits, um, bilingualism is, it's all around us really. So there are estimates that there are more bilinguals than monolinguals in the world. And I think that they're likely to be accurate given how interconnected we are. And given that, you know, there are, there are countries that have multiple official languages. So that people are going to, by, by definition, going to be able to communicate in more than one language. This is all the, another thing that's uh, worth bearing in mind here, that this is not to say that uh, all bilinguals are you know, able to talk in their multiple languages fluently and proficiently and so on. So it's a very broad umbrella term that's going to apply to anyone who can communicate to some extent in more than one language, but it is very widespread phenomenon. 
and it does place demand on our cognitive system. So we have plenty of evidence for that uh, because it is the sort of learning and, and using multiple languages is, is really something that we need to accommodate or adapt to, not in grand scale of things dissimilar to say, uh, you know, learning to drive or, or learning to play an instrument. So complex cognitive tasks that we need to sort of deal with in some way. So it has been shown to lead to adaptation of the underlying system, and in particular, um, involvement of cognitive control networks. So these would be prefrontal uh, cortices bilaterally, anterior cingulate portions of the uh, parietal lobes, and so on. Um, why would this be the case? Uh, we need to look at representation and processing in bilingualism. So how multiple languages are stored and how do we go on about choosing the, the right one and, and in the right communicative context. So regarding storage, what we know, and I think this is pretty well established and sort of makes sense for this, it's, is that um, mental lexicon is not organized alongside the uh, language you know, multiple languages lines. So in other words, it's not that we are storing English here and in Spanish here, because that's just doesn't make sense really. So we would have this sort of same underlying systems likely organized alongside semantic uh, lines that would have these sort of different labels, different phonologies attached to any, any specific label. So as I said earlier, the concept of chair is the same regardless of how you call it from, from you know, what language environment you're approaching it. So what that means then is that the lexical access is non-selective. It's not specifically, you know, with, with, with regards to these sort of different language lines. Uh, and then what happens as a result, and what's been again shown pretty consistently, is that parallel, um, there is parallel activation of lexical entries from multiple languages. So even if a speaker or listener is in entirely monolingual context, so talking to somebody in language X, uh, and them knowing and being able to use language Y is neither here nor there for that communicative context. It's be, still being shown that uh, those that other language is going, those lexical entries are going to be competing for access with the first one. So then as a result, what we need to employ is um, sort of selection and inhibition of the unwanted one. And again, plenty of data to support that that's, that's uh, you know, the case. Um, and then what followed from these findings are these hypotheses that basically, you know, what we are, what a bilingual is going to be exposed to constantly is uh, this selection inhibition that in a way that is going to influence their attentional control, that it's going to sort of enhance it. Think about it as like training it. You know, it's, it's a mental gym for, for attentional control and, and executive function processing. So you sort of um, these 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 um, effects would not be uh, constrained just to sort of language context, but are going to spill over to any any context in which there is competing information that needs to be suppressed. So it sort of becomes more of a domain general sort of executive function um, modification. And then, then that has also led to hypothesis uh, proposal about bilingual advantage. So the idea there is that following this sort of constant training and, and lifelong experience with suppressing irrelevant information, bilinguals might uh, end up outperforming monolinguals in uh, executive function tasks. This is highly contested. So there is tons and tons of um, you know, literature out there that some data are providing some evidence for this. Um, other data showing basically not replicating it or uh, arguing that any possible difference on executive function tasks between monolinguals and bilinguals um, can be explained due to various confounds that have not been controlled for properly. So things like socioeconomic status or education or cultural differences, all sorts of things that are notoriously difficult to sort of fully and completely equate between, between the participants. And at least from, from my reading of the literature, uh, it sort of got to the point where there is no 
movement either way. So there, there are, there are uh, these sort of contrasting opinions, but they're not, it's, it's, it's not uh, being getting resolved. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is because there's been uh, surprisingly little attention to under the bonnet. So what would be this modification? So what is this? You know, how does the system adapt? What's the nature of this modification that then might lead to um, yeah, differences in, in behavior or not? So unless we try to work this out, I think these behavioral data are going to be difficult to interpret and they're going to be messy and um, not necessarily, you know, cannot move forward much uh, with, with, with this discussion. So um, that is what I'll be focusing on. Basically, this, this research is trying to move this a little bit, looking at these sort of underlying mechanisms of modification. And we do have quite a lot of, again, sort of data to suggest that attentional control is the key thing that one would be focusing on here. So this is, again, possibly slightly descriptive term for this sort of bunch of uh, processes to do with selection inhibition. Um, that really would be the key thing to try to understand in order to um, progress. And this, there was this very recent paper by Alistair and Craig just this month that I think provides a fairly nice description of uh, why attentional control is something that, that would be the key thing to look into. Okay, so how are we doing this? Uh, what, what are we looking at? So we're focusing on selective attention and the underlying neural mechanisms of selective attention. And this again rests of two, on two uh, well-established findings. So the first one is that uh, we encode neurally the um, speech, temporal envelope in particular of speech. So there is synchronization between the signal, uh, auditory signal and um, neural activation, uh, so, for instance, if you look here at this little graph, uh, there is an utterance, black cars cannot park. So there is some sort of distribution of frequencies over time, at certain amplitude and so on. So envelope, temporal envelope is, is tracking the outline of that. Um, and this is synchronized with neural activation, particularly in theta band has been uh, shown that uh, argument is that this corresponds to syllabic rate of speech. So this is something that we are encoding. So that's the first thing. The second relevant thing here is that it's been again, very uh, consistently shown that these uh, synchronizations are robustly affected by attention. So if we are attending to a stream that is going to be more consistently or preferentially tracked compared to uh, ignored stream. So, we are taking these two um, well-established phenomena to look at um, how this selective attention is encoded neurally in monolinguals and bilinguals and compare it uh, between the groups. So what I will present then are two sets of data. Uh, the first, the three studies where we are basically establishing, using these techniques to establish whether there is a difference between monolinguals and bilinguals and this sort of neural encoding of uh, selective attention. And then once we establish that, uh, subsequent studies are trying to work out what exactly is happening, how, how this modification is taking place. Um, and yes, yeah, so all pretty much all studies, they follow the same general design. So participants are in what's known as a cocktail party paradigm. So they're presented with two uh, speech streams, narrative simultaneously, and they're told to attend one and to ignore another one, some dichotic listening. And basically they're just told that, you know, they, they're listening for, for comprehension. So they are asked comprehension, easy, well, they ask comprehension questions at the end of each narrative. So this is a straightforward, simple task that we expect people to be able to do and um, you know dichotic listening tasks in general are, are straightforward um, and it's as close to natural listening I think 
to what we can do in, in you know, experimental conditions, experimental um, environment. So then what we are manipulating is the type of interference that people are hearing, that they're presented with in, in the unattended side. Uh, so whether like monolinguals and bilinguals, they're always the attended story is always either in their, well, it's always native language or first language for, for, for bilinguals. So the expectation is that, you know, they're really no, not going to have an issue with this. Everybody is going to be able to do this task. There's not going to, there's not going to be, you know, comprehension issues here. So it's easy task. So, you know, native or first language attended and then unattended varies. So it can be uh, either another story in the same language, so native or first language for bilinguals. And the idea is that this is going to be most distracting because you're hearing two things that share, you know, all sorts of features. So it takes a bit of effort to, to ignore one and focus on the other. Then we have another condition in which they're listening to a story in a language that they do not speak. So they know it's a language, it sounds like a language, obviously, uh, but they are not able to comprehend what's, what these narratives are conveying. And this is still linguistic as a type of interference, but it's going to be less distracting because it's not, it's not you know, underpinned by semantics. Then we have a condition um, where the interference is non-linguistic. It's, it's, it's just sound, it's noise. We call musical rain. So basically this is um, generated sound where uh, we take the envelope and then fill it from an utterance, the existing utterance, and then fill it with um, fragments of short fragments of uh, consonants that are sort of jittered around. So once you put this all together, what you end up with is this sound that um, it sounds like water, it sounds like bubbles, so blop, 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 blop. So we call it musical rain. And the point here is that this is something that, um, you know, is, is completely, it doesn't sound like speech at all. So it cannot be interpreted as speech, but it's matched to speech in all the acoustic features. Um, so same energy and so on. And then we have a single talker condition where people are just listening to story in one ear, there's nothing in the other ear. So this is just baseline side, you know, comprehension that's not, um, there's no interference to it. Um, and in terms of the, uh, e, so most of these studies are EEG, so we are looking at the synchronization, um, so envelope tracking, um, by doing um, yeah, cross correlation between them. So effectively what this involves is taking an envelope of um, some utterance, then EEG data as people are listening to this, and then cross correlating the two um, with a sort of sliding window, certain time lags, 10, 10 millisecond um, time lags. So um, illustration of what this would work. So this is our EEG, and then we have envelope, and then basically just you go and over time, you take correlation between the two of them. So let's say we end up with something like that. So what this then means is that at about 200 milliseconds um, time lag, uh, there is the uh, that changes in envelope are maximally affecting the EEG signal. So they are sort of maximally synchronized between them. And this is the approach that's used in the first three studies. OK, so having sort of set all the uh, commonalities between studies and all of that, these are some of the data. So the first study involved just monolinguals, and we had uh, native uh, English speakers, and they were presented with these um, conditions that I just described. So they're always attending to English, and then they have either competing English narrative, they have something in Spanish that we established that they don't speak, but they know it's a language, musical rain and interference. And uh, the stimuli are kids' stories. 
So the idea there is that this is, you know, is going to make a task. There's not going to be any issue with understanding this. These are simple narratives. Uh, we chose stories that are not as familiar. So the, this, these were not, you know, Red Riding Hood type of things because that could be a bit too predictable, and then people could could answer comprehension uh, questions based on their previous knowledge of these rather than having actually listened. So um, these stories, there is a large number of sentences per condition. And then what we do is we record them individually, then concatenate them into one narrative, swap between ears and do all sorts of randomizations. And people are basically just listening. Um, and then we ask them questions about attended stories afterwards. And as expected, there's no issue with it at all. So people are um, nine, 95 percent or so behavioral performance. So um, some slight variation between conditions, but sort of ceiling overall. Now, in terms of uh, neural data that we are getting, uh, the EG data. So this is type of stuff we are getting. So if you just look at the top row, uh, basically what this shows is the um, correlation between the uh, EEG and the, um, the, the uh, envelope um, across different time lags. And different lines are representing different electrodes. So we have 128, I think, electrodes here. And then this is done for all the attended narratives um, and all the unattended. So this, this here is averaged across participants and across different conditions, so everything that was attended. And then we can just simply compare those. So what you can see from here that attended are more strongly encoded than the attended, as one would expect. We can also look at uh, when, you know, what's what over time when these um, cross correlations are strongest. And you can see here that there are some time windows with what looks like peaks, but effectively there is sort of one big cluster of cross correlations and then possibly something a bit later on about 500 milliseconds these are topographies and so on so nothing nothing hugely surprising here really um and then we can start breaking this down into different conditions so basically this is just exact same just in different conditions so the top row are all the attended narratives the bottom is everything that's unattended and then we can simply compare them against each other so uh, the first thing to see here is that you know, attended are more strongly encoded than the unattended across the board, each condition separately. Um, we can see when they start diverging from each other, uh, attended and unattended. And what that shows is that it's basically easier to discriminate between um, attended and unattended stream if the unattended stream is unintelligible. So if it's musical rain, for instance, and this fits really nicely with theories of, of attention that say that, you know, you can, you can achieve early selection and discrimination if you can, um, if the two streams can be discriminated based on some sort of low level features, so frequencies, for instance, or, or pitch or something. So in our case, we have something that is speech and something that's not speech. So that's, that's straightforward and they, they can be separated easily. Whereas something like um, English English, so there are two stories that are just, that convey it's the same language and same structures, that takes a little bit more time because presumably you would need to use some of these sort of high level functions, syntax and semantics to to discriminate them. So there is also the timing difference between conditions, and then what we can also compare is sort of between different conditions. So if you look at let's say all the attended ones. So in all these cases, participants are listening to an English story, right? The only difference is what's being presented in the other ear. And what we are seeing there is there is also a difference between conditions that uh, it varies as a function of the type of interference that it's stronger in, in um, English English case and weakest in English MUR case. So what this then allowed us to just establish as, as a baseline, if you want, is that yes, uh, attention is affecting uh, neural encoding. We can dissociate it in, in you know, how early differentiation can be made, and strength of encoding is varying as a function of type of interference. All good. Now, 
moving on to the um, equivalent studies in bilinguals. So we have two groups here. Um, one group are Spanish-English bilinguals, and the other group are Dutch-English bilinguals. So they're all early bilinguals. They've acquired a second language, I think, before the age of four or five, if I remember correctly. They are proficient. So they're all re um, recruited locally. So these would be people that would be using English dominantly, likely. Um, and the reason for the two groups is that uh, Dutch and English are typologically similar languages meaning that there is quite a lot of similarity in you know, vocabulary and phonology and so on. Uh, whereas Spanish and, and English are more distant, they are from different language families. And if we follow this, this hypothesis about um, you know, inhibition and selection between coactivated entries, you can make an argument that uh, something that's more similar to entries more similar, there is, that's gonna require possibly stronger selection, competition, different effect, different process to dis discriminate between them compared to two entries that are less similar to each other. Um, so what we have then is in, in the first group, um, all the Spanish English bilinguals, they're listening to stories in Spanish always, and then they have you know, Spanish as, as the most distracting interference then they have Serbian as their uh, unknown language interference. So, you know, for them, this is basically, they know it's a language, but it just sounds like a string of consonants. <laughs> that this is nowhere near um, intelligible. Then we have musical rain and no interference, and then the same stuff with Dutch participants. Um, same design, right? Children's stories, concatenated, swapped between ears, natural listening, nothing new there. So what do we see in terms of results? So the first thing to note is that behavioral performance is completely comparable between groups. So this is all sort of 90% plus, suggesting that people do not have any issue understanding these, these things. So uh, that performance is maintained throughout. Um, then this is still just you know, establishing that, that it worked as we would expect it to work. So we can look at um, all the attended cross correlations. So this is across groups, across participants, unattended, clearly stronger encoding of the attended versus the unattended. Um, you know, you can look at these you know, peaks of activation, um, some activation encoding. Uh, they don't look a million miles away from each other across different groups. Um, we can compare in each condition, in, in each uh, group, we can compare attended and unattended. Again, see that uh, attended is consistently encoded strong, more strongly than the unattended, so uh, as expected. Now, here is the interesting thing. So you'll remember that in the monolinguals task, monolinguals experiment, what we saw was that the attended uh, attended narratives um, have been encoded such that the strength of encoding varies or is dependent on, on the type of interference. Um, in both Spanish, English and Dutch English bilinguals, so these are two completely separate groups, they are acquired, I don't know, half a year apart or something, um, we see consistent results of completely flat, so there is no difference in, in, in the um, strength of the coding of, of the attended stream. So it does not vary as a function of the type of interference while all the groups are performing equally behaviorally. So, you know, this tells us that potentially something is going on here that, uh, you know, the underlying system is, you know, supporting the same behavior with different configuration of the system. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's a little bit convoluted, but so we, what we couldn't do in this study straightforwardly was to compare directly encoding in one group versus the other, because we have, you know, different groups of people, different participants, and they're listening to different stories as in different languages. And that basically makes it tricky to, to do direct comparison of, you know, the strength of encoding and so on. 
So to avoid that, but still try to do some comparison across groups, we turn to this um, multivariate RSA, representational similarity analysis. So this is sort of, you know, second order um, correlation that we are looking at. So effectively, what's happening here is, so we have these um, three windows that we um, defined early on as likely peaks of, of encoding across groups. And then if we just focus on this one here, so basically, this is a snapshot of uh, encoding of activation in this group at this particular uh, time window for different conditions. So we have a matrix that is seven by seven. So these are seven different conditions that uh, we can identify in these people. So, you know, they have the four attended streams. So listening to, in this case, Spanish, when interference is Spanish, listening to Spanish when the interference is Serbian and so on. And then these are all the uh, unattended stories. And then basically what we do was to um, take pairwise comparisons uh, for each pair of conditions. So, you know, imagine up here at the top would be those same conditions. And then you compare native to native at that particular time point, the the you know, synchronized, the um, encoding, um, and you know that's identical. That's the same thing. Um, so basically, there, the, there is zero dissimilarity between them. So if you look at the scale down here, you know that's the same same thing. Whereas you know this is a comparison of uh, native and unknown. So that's dissimilar. Um, there's and so on. So we have one snapshot of of uh, pattern of behavior in this particular group at this particular time point. And then we do that for each group. And then what we can basically do is correlate these uh, matrices to see to what extent are they similar, to what extent is a pattern of behavior similar across these different groups. And if we take monolinguals as our baseline, you know, so we're looking at what are modifications relative to, to monolinguals, um, the bottom line is that there is more in, in the Dutch English bilinguals, um, there's more consistent difference across all these different time points compared to monolinguals, whereas in the Spanish English bilinguals, this is not quite as consistently always different from monolinguals. The inference being that um, if, you know, the typologically similar combination of languages is going to potentially lead to more comprehensive modulation of these systems compared to the monolingual baseline um, due to possibly, you know, lifelong experience of this stronger interference. So you need to modulate the system possibly you know, more, more um, comprehensively compared to what needs doing in, in the other group. Um, so what we had there then across these three studies is evidence that bilingualism does modify uh, these mechanisms of selective attention, uh, that this appears to be more, a little bit more pronounced if the two languages are more similar, well, arguably due to uh, requiring stronger selection, inhibition between them. Um, and all of this is seen uh, in the absence of behavioral differences between groups, hence suggesting that you know, this some sort of neuromodulation of these mechanisms that, that that's aimed at just keeping performance uh, optimal, keeping it uh, maximal um, so that people can fully comprehend and understand all these stories. So this was um, what that allowed us to establish. The thing is that this still doesn't quite tell us about the nature, the mechanism of these modifications. And that's what the uh, following set of studies is going to look into. So there are at least two ways one can think about this. So what is the possible mechanism? Um, so according to this dominant view in, in the literature, um, basically the, the uh, you know, there's going to be this enhancement of the capacity for select, select, selective attention in bilinguals. 
and then the way that can be applied to our data, you could say, well, perhaps uh, what we have there is that in the bilingual context, you know, there is sort of sufficient resource, amount of resource um, to um, allow efficient processing of those attended streams, regardless of the type of interference. You can deal with it, whatever the system throws at you. Um, so as a result, we are not seeing variation in the encoding due to the type of interference, while still these people, you know, bilinguals, are able to fully comprehend these attended stories and, and you know, that, that is, um, so yeah, I'm just going to repeat myself, ample resources for efficient processing. So that's one way of thinking about it. The other way could be something along these lines. Um, selective attention is not unlimited. So there is finite capacity to it. We can only attend to a set number of things at any given point. And it's also possible that the very act of selection or inhibition is going to draw on, the, on that resource. It's going to basically use up some of it and restrict what's left, what's available of the resource. So what you then, if you have this sort of restricted amount, however, tiny little bit of restriction, uh, you need to economize what's left. It, the resources need to be redistributed, redistributed in order to support optimal task completion. So it's a slightly different way of, of looking at what might be underpinning the effects that we've seen. And that's what we've set to test in, in subsequent studies. So this is a study that uh, tests the nature of these modifications. We obviously wanted to be able to directly compare between the groups. So it had to be the same materials throughout. And the other thing we wanted to look at was to what extent are these modifications um, reflecting the time you had to practice this, the exposure. So in other words, you know, is it that they are gonna be visible in adults who have had lots of time since their early acquisition of, of the two languages and um, what's gonna happen in, in children who didn't have that much time to practice. So is it just going to basically not be visible in children or is it the case that this is really a comprehensive, you know, is a demand that requires this sort of modification from the onset when you start um, dealing with demands of, of bilingualism. So we are testing kids that are in the age range of 7 to 12, um, and the rationale for this was that they're old enough to be able to do selective attention tasks consistently. Uh, younger groups are not, not as consistent, um, and there is possibly some sort of plateau, developmental plateau at that point in terms of selective attention that um, we might be looking at, at something that's relatively stable uh, before it possibly changes again. So what we have here are two groups, uh, so it's monolinguals, bilinguals here, they're all um, proficient fluent bilinguals who are um, using, so that, you know, they're again, recruited locally. So uh, they are following basically that school in English. Um, and on top of that, they are also exposed to at least another language on a daily basis at home. And there is a mix of languages here. So, uh, you know, so the Afrikaans and Spanish and Swedish and Hungarian and all sorts of things. Um, but it's not a single group. Uh, but they're all fluent and, and proficient and using English on a daily basis. So, so we have our four conditions again. So they're all listening to the English story in the attended ear. And then there is you know, different story in English as the most interfering. Uh, we have Latin as the um, interference of the unknown language. And the reason for this was, <laughs> You know, we tried very hard to think of a language that we can guarantee our participants, none of our participants is going to be exposed to. And it was next to impossible because however, you know, whatever you look for, it's likely that somebody will, will 
be, had some experience with that. So Latin was thought as a sort of safe bet that <laughs> it's 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 not you know, in daily usage anywhere. Um, and then we had you know musical rain and no interference. Um, same same design as before. So now you know the, the comprehension, dichotic listening, you know, swapping between years and so on. So what do data show? So the first thing is that these behavioral comprehension scores um, basically tell us that children are able to do this no problem at all. And um, there is no difference between monolinguals and bilinguals overall or in any of the tasks. The analysis is slightly different. So what we are doing here is reconstructing the envelope. Um, so um, using this toolbox here, MTRF toolbox. So basically um, feed the uh, speech envelope and the EG recording uh, that provides use this uh, leave one out cross validation process to produce a reconstruction of the signal. And then that is correlated with the original speech envelope to tell us how well it's been reconstructed. Um, and this is done on a sentence by sentence basis. So this is what we see now, the data. So again, we have attended and unattended. Uh, so these are all the attended streams, non-attended streams. And you can see that in both monolinguals and bilinguals, we see um, that the attended streams are more accurately reconstructed than non-attended and that holds across the individual conditions. Now, this is the interesting bit. So this is the same data just presented slightly differently. So these are mean reconstruction values, um, all the attended ones uh, in the two groups and all the unattended ones. So the first thing to notice here is that on average, the uh, bilinguals reconstruction scores are lower than the monolinguals. So we see no evidence for the enhanced capacity here. The next thing, is that there is more variation across the attended stream than the unattended stream, sorry, the attended stream in monolinguals than in bilinguals. So this replicates this pattern that we saw earlier that you know, in monolinguals it really varies as a function of interference, in bilinguals less so. And then the third thing is this specificity of where the two are directly different from each other when you directly compare them. And it turns out that it's in these conditions uh, of a single talker and, and when musical rain is interference. So basically this is, there is either no interference or interference is not particularly bothering you because it's not uh, easy to comprehend. And the way we then interpreted this is to say, okay, so we see no evidence for enhancement to start with, but the reason why these particular conditions are um, you know, less encoded in, in, in bilinguals than in monolinguals is that if you are dealing with a reduced capacity, reduced overall amount, then you're still trying to maintain optimal performance, behavioral performance, comprehension, so, and they're still achieved, but that's going to be easily, more easily achieved in these conditions, if you have reduced capacity, you know, you can drop this down effectively and still have full comprehension, whereas that wouldn't be as easily done in the cases where interference is stronger. So the idea there is that, um, yeah, I mean, this is just a summary. So um, what I just said, accrual and behavioral performance, effects of attention and, and so on, but um, there is this, um, less interference, uh, um, sorry, weaker encoding with interference is less distracting, possibly because uh, optimal behavioral performance is easier to sustain in these conditions, can be supported with a reduced potential bandwidth. So suggesting that really we are talking about redistribution of a system that economizes what's available rather than overall enhancement. Um, and I will Devil, I'm okay for another few minutes. Oh, okay. So this is briefly just to uh, present an, uh, another couple of slides on, on another data set and I'll just wrap it all up. 
So, um, you know, this, what we saw in this previous experiment was slightly going ahead you know, against what's um, in the literature. So then we set up another two studies to, to really see if we can replicate these data. So this was done online behaviorally because this was the only way you can do it uh, you know, recently. So we now have kids and, and grown-ups, monolingual, bilinguals. Uh, they're doing, so they're both highly proficient in both languages and so on doing that same type of task. But on top of that, we are adding a visual task that is designed to stretch the performance further. So um, basically just to illustrate what's going on. So they are doing this usual thing that we saw already. And then at the same time, they're presented with this sort of visual task where they are watching for a dog that appears on top of the screen, but not at the bottom. And the idea is that this is just going to tax, stretch the system further. So then if we have the enhancement, then bilinguals, you know, they will be able to deal with this fine. So they're gonna be better for performing than monolinguals. Whereas if we have this sort of, you know, redistribution of limited capacity, then bilinguals are expected to perform worse than monolinguals. Comprehension scores, behaviorally, you know, understanding narratives, as, as, as we've seen before, all uh, at ceiling, high accuracy, no difference between uh, monolinguals and bilinguals, either children or grown-ups. But when you look at the visual data, basically in both children and adults, we see that bilinguals are consistently and significantly slower than monolinguals on this task, which seems to provide more evidence for this idea that if you stretch the system further, you know, something, <laughs> there is so much to, 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 to be able, you know, to go around. Um, so it affects this performance. So to wrap it all up. So we have provided further evidence or just provided a confirmation that there is modification to those underlying neural systems for selective attention in bilingual, bilingualism that reflects demands because of this sort of typological similarity effect. Um, however, in terms of mechanism, instead of that enhanced capacity, we seem to be seeing evidence for redistribution that economizes these available resources, and this becomes particularly obvious when the system is stretched to the extent that, you know, dual task needs to be performed. But all of that is done at, the t you know, with, with behavioral performance on that primary comprehension task unimpaired throughout, really suggesting that all this stuff is sort of happening under the bonnet that is just uh, there to support that performance. And this is my final slide, but just to, to you know, clarify or make sure that uh, we don't have um, you know, unintended interpretations here. So we do seem to see that management of competing languages draws on attentional resources. But this does not have adverse effects on performance. So our data are definitely not saying, you know, bilingualism, learn another language, and then that's going to impair your performance and all of that. You know, we're not going back to early 19th century and interpretations of bilingualism is bad for you. I think it's actually possibly the opposite because you can interpret this as, as suggesting that, you know, even if these resources are, are you know, redistributed, um, you are still managing to do the same performance. So it can, it can suggest increased flexibility in the usage of the available resources, enabling bilinguals to do more with less or same with less, I think is, is pro probably more um, accurate way of putting it. So basically, it's the, you know we're not seeing that that enhancement as a result of, of bilingualism. Um, seeing something else possibly still uh, can be explained as flexibility, but it's not it's not just a simple story of you know hey, there is you, know, you just learn another language, there is enhancement, and you know everyone lives happily ever after. But there is still clearly lots lots to work out in terms of you know what exactly is going on here. And that is all I had to say, and apologies for running a little bit over. 
Thank you, Mariana, for that really enlightening talk and fascinating insight into how bilingualism can affect the brain. Join us next week when we welcome Dr. Michael Hastings. Michael is the head of the neurobiology division of the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. He holds an honorary professorship in the Department of Physiology, Development and Neuroscience here at the university and is also a fellow of the Royal Society. His research aims to understand the neurobiology of circadian clocks and more specifically his group uses a molecular genetic approach to elucidate the mechanisms of circadian timekeeping in mammals. He'll be telling us why the suprachiasmatic nucleus is such a brilliant circadian timekeeper. For more info on this seminar series and all things neuro related here in Cambridge, follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.